Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, in today's uh, webinar, we're going to talk a little bit about trademarks and a very specific topic of trademarks that often scares people uh, when they get this happening to them. It's called oppositions. So a lot of times uh, when you file trademarks, you'll get uh, through the process and suddenly there'll be an opposition happening in your mark. So that's what we're going to try to cover today. And uh, I'm Juven with uh, Dana Legal Services, and I've got Michael here with me. Michael, go ahead and introduce yourself. Give us a little about your background so we can get started on this topic, because Michael's our expert today on oppositions. Sure, yes. Uh, my name is Michael Schroeder. I'm a partner at Reyes and Schroeder Associates, uh, trademark.legal. Uh, I do all manner of intellectual property law, but I have a specific specialty in, in trademark prosecution and trademark litigation, uh, particularly before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. Uh, so I have a lot of experience with uh, these types of oppositions um, and how to handle them uh, if you get opposed during the opposition period. Perfect. And again, Michael, thank you so much for making yourself available to help people out, uh, provide some information, some background. Uh, just so everyone's clear, we're not giving legal advice in any form, uh, but we are going to give you an overview of the process. So, Michael, let me start with the most basic question. When I want to protect my trademark, what is it that I need to do and what's that process look like? So this is way before I even see an opposition. So I got a mark I want to protect. How does that process work? Well, you can protect that mark, uh, you know, right away by uh, filing an intent to use application at the trade at uh, the USPTO. Um, and you don't have to already be using that mark to file your trademark application. You can file it uh, under an intent to use basis. And when your trademark registers, uh, your rights will extend back to that initial filing date. Um, so that would be the first thing to do to get widespread uh, federal trademark rights across the entire United States. Uh, now, Michael, you mentioned that, you mentioned that um, I don't have to be using it, but what if I'm already using it and I haven't filed? Am, am I out of luck or can I still do that? No, you certainly can still file and we would recommend that you file you know, right away uh, to try and protect your mark. When you are already using your mark, you do have what's called common law trademark rights, but those rights are only specific to the geographic location in which you're using the mark. If you want rights that extend across the entire United States and all of its territories, you got to get a trademark registration with the USPTO. Now, so well, wait a minute. What if, what if I sell my stuff through the internet? What's my geographical limitation then? Is it just where I'm physically located? It's where the goods are sold and where they travel to. So anywhere the goods are sold and the mark is in use, uh, that uh, affects your common law uh, geographic scope. Okay, so now let's go through this process. I, I've filed my mark for registration. The trademark office has examined my mark and they've approved it for publication. So yeah, that's they give great. You notice. So that, you know, a lot of people think that that's you know, that's the bulk of the work because they get, they file the mark and they may have gotten a refusal from a USPTO examining attorney. They've overcome that refusal and they've gotten a notice, hey, your mark's approved for publication. Uh, and they think that's the end of the game. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, all trademarks uh, before they register uh, go through what's called this, this publication opposition period uh, of 30 days where they can be opposed by any third party that takes issue uh, with the use and registration of that mark. So let's make sure people understand this. When a mark gets published, uh, are they like publishing it in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, where are they publishing it? They're publishing it in what's called the Federal Gazette, which is a, a weekly publication that's released by the USPTO. Thousands and thousands of trademarks get uh, published each week um, and they're published in this Federal Gazette. And this Federal Gazette is available, publicly available. Uh, there are third party watch companies that may monitor uh, the Federal Gazette to inform uh, registered trademark owners that there is a possibly conflicting mark. Um, larger companies have their own teams that, that monitor the Federal Gazette as well. Um, and so that's the first time where your mark is potentially out there uh, for some of these larger companies to view and take notice of. So if, uh, if my mark is something that a third party is considering conflicting with their mark or their brand, that's where they find out through this official publication called the Official Gazette. That's, that's, that's one of the primary ways that they find out, yes, yes. And then once they find out, they file, is that, is that when they file the opposition then, right? That's when they file that opposition? Yeah, they have a 30-day window to either file an opposition or an extension to the opposition period. Uh, they can extend that opposition period uh, for up to 90 additional days. 
um, if they make that filing. And oftentimes they do just so that they can have their own team look at it and decide whether or not an opposition is worth it in this particular scenario. Uh, but they only have that 30 day initial 30 day window to file the opposition or that extension. Okay, so how will I know as a trademark applicant that someone is opposing my mark? What's the first time or how do I find out? Well, you get served with a complaint, essentially, uh, a, a, a notice, what's called a notice of opposition. Um, and you're served that from the Trademark Trial Appeal Board themselves. So they'll send it to uh, the email address that they, they have on record uh, for you. Um, and you get a notice of the complaint and you also get the to see the full complaint and what all the claims are in the complaint. Uh, and essentially it, it looks a lot similar to if you were sued in, in federal court. Uh, the Trademark Trial Appeal Board follows a lot of the same rules as the federal rules of evidence. Okay, so now in that scenario, let's say someone does file an opposition. I'm like, oh my God, my mark, someone's opposing it. I can't get it. Or, or, or do I need to hire an attorney? What, what should I do at that point? Yeah, so at that point, it's out of the USPTO's hands and you are dealing uh, directly with uh, a third party who, as you said, um, has taken some sort of issue uh, with your use or registration of the mark. Um, and so there are a number of different ways uh, that you can approach this. You can contact the opposer uh, directly, um, but what we always recommend is that you hire an attorney to fully review the complaint um, and to move swiftly to file an answer uh, to defend against all these claims and it preserves all of your defenses. Uh, if you don't file that answer first, you, are, you have a, a 40 day deadline. Um, and if you, don't, if you miss that deadline, your application uh, goes abandoned. Um, and so the only so, way- So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. You're saying that if an opposition is filed, the complaint comes, I receive it, and I fail to respond to it, that's it. My application's done. That's, that's it. Uh, uh, you have 40 wow. days to respond. Um, there are ways uh, to file a late response and the board is often lenient. Uh, with allowing late responses, but it's not, it's not uh, something that you want to do because immediately you're, you're at risk uh, of losing your entire application without a fight. Now, if, if I see that opposition and I need help, let's just say, you know, I, I decide I'm not going to handle this myself. I'm going to hire an attorney. What should I be looking for in the attorney to know that this is the right kind of, do I need a civil litigator? Do I need a specialized person? What, what are their skill sets that I'm looking for in order to hire the right person? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, you want a person that's knowledgeable uh, and skilled at, at trademark law, first and foremost, because it's a highly nuanced area of law. Um, and there are many ways to defend, credible ways to defend against an opposition that, as a layman, you might think is hopeless. Um, so you want an attorney that is, that is really um, experienced in, in trademark law. You also want an attorney that's experienced with litigation and particularly litigation before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board because while the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board does follow most of the same rules as the federal rules of evidence, it has its own unique rules that, that are very strict in many cases that you have to comply with. Um, and only an attorney that is you know, frequent in handling those types of, of Trademark Trial and Appeal Board proceedings, TTAB proceedings, uh, would be knowledgeable about uh, those nuances. And you don't want your case thrown out because you, you know, have an attorney that uh, didn't submit the evidence properly, for instance, or, or, or any number of issues. So give me an example of a couple of questions I should ask the person I'm going to hire to represent me, the attorney that I'm going to hire to represent me. What are some of the questions I should ask them to give me perspective as to whether they know this area of law? Oh, what's your area of specialty? Uh, um, you know, how long have you been practicing? Um, do you handle uh, TTAB cases? Um, and, and what does TTAB stand for? <laughs> yes, TTAB, the Trademark Trial and, and Appeal Board is short okay. for TTAB. So when you get a notice, you'll see TTAB on it. That means uh, that you're in front of the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. That's great. Any other thoughts on, on the questions I should ask the person that's going to represent me? Yeah, well, they should, you should um, show them the complaint, I would think, and, and ask uh, you know, what their initial thoughts are um, on the complaint. So, uh, and you, know, you want an attorney that's going to uh, 
um, make things straightforward uh, and simple, mm -hmm. and uh, but also one that doesn't doesn't hide the ball and and um, identifies all risks, all possible risks. That, that's a, it's very interesting that you know uh, you say that someone identifies all the risks uh, to what you're going to do. Is there some things that you could do up front when you're getting ready to file your trademark application to minimize the chances of an opposition? Like, can you request the uh, trademark uh, office not to publish your mark? No. All marks that register on the principal register uh, must be published for opposition prior to. Okay. Registering. Well, that idea didn't work. So, okay, it's got to get published. Um, what are some of the things I could have done up front to minimize my risk of opposition? Sure, you, you could have done a clearance search. Uh, so, uh, whether that search is limited to a, a USPTO availability search or a knockout search, typically I would recommend a broader search uh, uh, that covers, um, you know, the entire territory of the United States. Um, there are many companies that offer those types of trademark searches in advance of filing uh, that will uh, advise you of any similar marks that are out there. Um, and if you encounter a similar mark uh, from particularly from a, a, a large player uh, in a relevant industry, uh, you should view that as a potential risk for opposition, even if you do get the mark past the USPTO examining attorney. So let, let me give a hypothetical, for example. Um, you, you, the food chain called McDonald's. They have McFish, McThis, McThat. If I wanted to sell a brand of shoe and called it McShoe, do you think that I would have an issue? Would that be something that I would have to be cautious about, even though it's not in the food industry, it's in the clothing industry? Potentially, certainly potentially. And, and, and that's a really good question uh, because it highlights uh, the expanded scope of protection that famous registered marks have um, at the USPTO and Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. So while uh, a, a Mick uh, shoe could get through for shoes from the USPTO, uh, when it gets to the opposition stage, McDonald's has um, the ability to oppose that mark on what's called a dilution claim, which is only available to famous marks. Uh, and it's an analysis that the examining attorney at the USPTO typically doesn't uh, do in their likelihood of confusion analysis. Uh, so that's another reason why if you encounter similar famous marks, you need to be particularly wary because they have this additional ability to oppose you, um, even if you are operating what you would believe to be outside the scope of their space. So even if their goods and services are totally different from yours, it's still possible that because of their fame, they could attack your mark in an opposition setting. Yes, and uh, uh, companies uh, try to, it, fame is a very high bar to meet, okay? It's a very high legal bar to meet and companies try to say that they're famous all the time when maybe they're not. In your scenario, McDonald's certainly meets that, that famous um, uh, uh, condition. Um, but just because a company is well known um, and they claim that they have a famous mark, that doesn't necessarily mean that their mark is famous. And so that's when you know an experienced attorney is, is necessary to look at these claims and, and see if they're credible. So let me see if I can recap some of the points we've made. You file an application, you go through the process, your application finally gets approved, it gets published. It's during publication where people are going to come and potentially oppose your mark. When your mark gets opposed, you have a window of time in which you can respond. If you don't respond within that window of time, you lose your mark, your mark basically, or your application goes abandoned, right? And, and, and let me interrupt you right here. Uh, a lot of times uh, people think that they get opposed um, and they don't have the money to defend against this. So they're just not even gonna deal with it and they're gonna let their mark go abandoned. Uh, without engaging the opposer at all in any sort of settlement. And then they continue using the mark anyway. Well, at that's that point, what I was going to ask you next. Keep going. That's perfect. That's perfect. Right. Well, that's, that's highly inadvisable because at that point in time, you have already uh, become knowledgeable that there is a third party out there that is claiming that your mark is infringing on theirs. Furthermore, you now have a judgment 
uh, before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, albeit a default judgment, uh, that uh, affirms all of these third parties' claims. And so now if that third party uh, takes issue with your continued use of your mark, they could bring you into court on infringement grounds and you could be sued as a willful infringer, in which case- and now you, you, you Now you're moving out of the trademark appeal area into federal court. Yes, and it's in federal court where monetary damages are available. There are no monetary damages available in the Trademark Trial Appeal Board setting. It's strictly about the registration of your application or not. But uh, when you're a willful, inf if, you're, if you are deemed to be a willful infringer, you could be liable for triple award of damages and attorney's fees in and so a willful, successful infringement. Yeah. yeah, so willful means you knew about it. Means you knew about it and you infringed And you anyway. ignored it. Mm-hmm. Now, so let, let's go over that. So you, you had your mark published. It was opposed. You chose to do nothing. Your mark, went, your application went abandoned. At that point, you literally need to think carefully about whether you continue to use that mark or whether you need to change it completely, right? Because what you just said is someone could come after you if you keep using it. Yeah, I mean, at that point in time, you're, you're, if you continue operating, you're forever operating under a cloud of liability. And at any point in time, the rug could be pulled out from underneath you. So, you know, you either need to engage and, and come to some sort of agreement or win the proceeding, or you need to rebrand. The, the only bad thing you can do is ignore it and continue using. Okay. All right. So now we're at a point where we have a mark that's being opposed, you hired an attorney, you're ready to deal with the opposition. What are some of the things that happen during the opposition process? So a complaint is filed, then what happens next? A complaint is filed. And uh, sometimes uh, opposing counsel will reach out to you directly to try and negotiate uh, the settlement right after the complaint is filed. Other times they'll wait for you to file your answer. Uh, again, uh, all of the negotiation leverage is in the office, is in the opposer's favor until you file that answer and, and get out from underneath that deadline. Once you file the answer uh, within uh, 30 days of, of that, um, the parties will get together in what's called the mandatory discovery conference. Um, it's at that time that both parties' attorneys uh, talk about each other's claims and defenses and any procedural matters that govern the proceeding. And they're also obligated at that point in time to discuss any possibility of settlement. So that's a really good time to have your attorney uh, uh, forcefully argue your case with uh, the opposing counsel and uh, see if there's any room there uh, to negotiate a settlement that's mutually agreeable to both sides. Now, when we talk about a settlement, um, Earlier, you mentioned that in federal court, there's monetary damages, but at the appeal board, there's no real monetary damages. So what does these settlements look like? Are they just an agreement to coexist with no money exchanged or what's going on there? Well, settlements can take any form, right? Judgments at the Trademark Trial, trial Appeal Board, there's no monetary uh, uh, issue. I see. Uh, but, but with settlements, it's just a negotiation um, with a third party. So. Uh, Typically, uh, money is not routinely exchanged, but it can be. Uh, settlements can take any form. Um, a lot of settlements uh, either deal with limiting the scope of use uh, and allowing continued use and registration through what's called a consent and coexistence agreement, or uh, some uh, larger companies are only concerned, they're not concerned about your use and they'll let you continue to use your mark uh, they're just concerned about keeping the federal registry clean of, of marks that they feel are uh, confusingly similar. And so um, you know, oftentimes uh, they will want you to abandon your registration, your application, but they'll allow you they'll, to uh, continue using the mark in the manner that you have been. You just don't have any federal rights to it, limited to common law rights. Um, I see. So it's quite possible that you could come out of this opposition with the rights to continue to use your mark, but not able to register it. it that is one possibility. Uh, the other possibility is that you have very broad wording in your application that describes far more than what you're actually doing. Um, and by narrowing that wording into what you're actually doing, uh, it, it doesn't cause any confusion or, or competition with the opposer's space. And so they'll allow you to uh, register your mark, 
with that exclusion or that limitation. And that's another possible form of settlement. Now, with trademark trial appeal board proceedings, the vast majority of these cases settle at some point. I'm talking like 95%, you know, settle at some point before reaching trial. Because if you're going to trial, you're looking at a year and a half to a two year process uh, before you're even before a board to get any sort of ruling on the matter. Um, and at any point in time during that two year process, the parties can settle. Uh, and there's constant negotiations back and forth based on the claims and the evidence and, and, and what comes to light. Now, earlier you mentioned that you could change the wording. What part of the application are you changing when you say change the wording? Are you changing the mark? Or? Yeah, we're not changing the mark, although uh, you can change the mark in, in a settlement. Uh, that would require you to file a new application. We can't make any material changes to a mark in an application once it's already been filed. Um, but the wording that I'm talking about is the goods or the services description. Okay, so, okay. So if you have, let's say, retail store services, featuring a wide variety of consumer goods. But in reality, you only sell golf clubs, right? And so you might have been opposed by someone else selling uh, you know, uh, pet supplies uh, that thinks that you have a confusingly similar mark. Well, when you narrow your services description to retail store services featuring golf clubs and not pet supplies, it, 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 it takes you them out of that competition space and, and minimizes consumer confusion. So there are several ways out of the opposition. One is basically to ignore it and do nothing, which is not a good idea. The other is to file a response to the opposition and then come to some kind of settlement agreement, uh, which could include changing your description of the goods and services. Um, do you have any other things that could be a possible outcome of an opposition? Well, yeah, I mean, oftentimes uh, there are certain words that are bright line, you know, uh, uh, non-starters for the opposer. They don't want you using billionaire in your mark or something like that. And so uh, um, you'll negotiate to use billionaire in some way with some additional wording uh, that uh, the opposer is okay with. And in that case, you still get to use uh, a substantially similar mark that you're okay with. And the opposer will let that mark pass once it's refiled. Again, you have to refile it, but now you have this consent uh, settlement agreement that will allow it to pass through and you won't get the same opposition. Um, so that's another way, changing your mark slightly, uh, limiting your trade channels, where you sell your goods, limiting the geographic locations. I've had settlements where clients agree to stay on opposite coasts, East Coast versus West Coast. Um, so all those types of, of geographic limitations and uh, uh, scope limitations and changes to the marks, all those uh, are ways to potentially settle. Uh, Excellent. You know what? Uh, this is clearly not something that you should try to tackle on your own if you're not an expert in the space. That being said, um, Nicole, I want to find out if there's any questions that we could address because we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I was too focused on asking Michael all these questions. I don't think I gave people a chance to ask there. So let me just open the door uh, to other people's questions, Nicole. Sure. Yep, there's one in the chat right now. Oh, so one of the questions, Michael, is, you know, what, what do the costs look like to deal with, uh, you know, the opposition? So, you know, you're, you're in that publication period and someone opposes you. What are roughly the range of costs, assuming normal type things, nothing out of the ordinary? What's yeah, I mean, costs uh, can range uh, and they all depend on, on the attorney and the firm that, that you're using uh, a lot of uh, firms out there uh, for this type of, of TTAB litigation work. They require an upfront retainer of 10 to $15,000 and they bill hourly down from that retainer. Um, uh, other firms out there, op like my firm, uh, operates on an upfront and flat fee basis for each stage or filing uh, of the, the trademark uh, opposition process. Um, and uh, so what, what are the different stages that, for example, in your firm, you guys, are, do, they, do you have name? Are there three stages? How many stages and what are roughly the costs for those? So uh, for my firm, uh, who is, we're, we're positioned uh, on the lower end of the fees in the market, in this space, uh, we uh, 
initially we would charge uh, a $1,200 fee uh, to file your answer. Uh, and that includes any affirmative defenses and, and counterclaims that, that you might have. Uh, then to engage in the mandatory discovery conference uh, with uh, the opposing counsel, uh, we charge a flat fee of $600 uh, for that. And, and, and that um, conference can, uh, can get quite testy and, and, and detailed. Uh, oh yeah, those things that, can take a long time. So that, they that's, can. yeah. Uh, but it's out of that conference, it's out of that conference that you understand where the parties are and, and if there is any possibility of settlement and, and quite frankly, where to push back on, on some of their claims to carve out a better settlement for your client. So that's really one of the most crucial areas uh, of the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board to have an attorney represent you because otherwise you're going to be steamrolled by uh, the opposer's attorney um, who is much more knowledgeable about this area of law and, and they might be disingenuous uh, about um, the strength of some of their claims. Wow. So looking at the um, process, Nicole, are there any other questions? Because I don't want to, again, go back to me asking all the questions. I want people to get a chance. Okay, so here's another one. Uh, so the question is, shouldn't a trademark search at the beginning of the filing, 100% ensure that I will not receive an opposition? I mean, is it a guarantee it, 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 that it, if you do the search, you won't get opposition? Well, no, it, it depends how, how risk averse you are, uh, for starters. Um, like I said, you know, we, you never know um, if an opposer is going to oppose you during the opposition period. One great way, another great way, aside from the trademark search, if there is something that comes up on the trademark search that uh, you think is suspect, you have your attorney look into uh, that entity's history with the Trademark Trial Appeal Board to see if they're active at the Trademark Trial Appeal Board. You may find out that they've filed you know, 35 oppositions in the last month, in which case you could say, bet, your, bet that you're gonna get an opposition. Uh, but they might be completely inactive in that space and they might not be policing it. And that's where uh, a, an attorney can advise you on what the risk is to move forward. And if you're already heavily invested in your brand, it might be worth it for you to test, test it and give it a shot. Uh, because just because you're opposed, it doesn't mean that you have to stop using your mark. There's always a way out. That, that's great. Um, other than looking at the other company's possible activity, is there a way to find out if they're actively searching other than looking at whether or not they've actually filed oppositions? Yeah, the way, the way I do it is I, I just see, I, I look at their opposition history. At the okay. Um, and uh, I see how active they are. And if they haven't opposed anybody for over a decade, you know, the, the risk is, is probably lower. Um, but, but there's no I, way of knowing for sure if they're monitoring, right? No way to know for sure if they're monitoring. Also, uh, you could come across a situation where someone has filed a trademark after you, and they, your mark has been cited by the examining attorney as uh, a possibly conflicting application. And so this person that filed after you may want to file an opposition against your mark just so that they can get a consent and coexistence agreement of their own so that their mark can get approved. Um, so you don't know when that's happening. Um, and and uh, it could be an individual that does that as well. It doesn't have to be a large company. So just because you do a trademark search, it, it, it doesn't preclude an opposition, but it should give you a good idea of the risks um, to file. Perfect. I think that's all the time we have, Michael. Um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, if people have questions, they can follow up with you or us and we can help them put them in the right place, give them the right support. Um, Nicole, uh, at this point, I think we can wrap up the call unless there's some burning questions we've got to get to. Nope, we're good to go. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, you, Nicole. Guys.